As I suggested to you before, economics is divided into these two areas, microeconomics and macroeconomics. Micro is the study of individual decision making by buyers in the marketplace and by sellers in the marketplace. The term macroeconomics refers to the study of the entire economy. Macro meaning large means the study of the overall economic system. What are the various factors that determine the total level of production in the United States economy or in any particular economy? What are the factors that determine the general level of interest rates in the economy? What are the factors that determine the rate of labor utilization, often measured as the unemployment rate? What are the factors that determine the general level of prices, such as the rate of inflation uh, as measured by uh, various price indices? So that's what we want to focus on in this portion of the review. Uh, and I apologize, by the way, for not being able to handle this more with individual questions. But because we're taping, we want to try and get through a presentation of each of these. So if you have particular questions, I'm happy to stay uh, afterwards. But you'll understand my, my uh, desire to try and encapsulize each of these particular uh, principles. One point I would make to you is the following. You are taking an exam of 16 questions. There are 10 principles on which you're being tested. What does that tell you is going to be true? There are 16 questions. There are only 10 principles. So let's bring. Very good. Some of, the quest, some of the principles you'll have multiple questions on. Some of the principles you'll only have one question on. And that is the way the exams are constructed, by the way. It's not like we'll cover the 10 and then ask you five questions about principle number seven. Good, so in your preparation with the 10 principles, you want to optimize your preparation time, and that might involve taking eight of those principles and saying, I really want to know these in depth, or some ratio like that. Uh, and in that sense, because your goal is uh, a 50% pass rate and a 60% average across exams, that may be an optimal strategy. Instead of trying to do everything, uh, you know, concentrate on some subset uh, and then, you know, cover the other ones briefly, but uh, that would be my recommendation. As we study the operation of the overall economy, the first thing we're interested in measuring is the overall level of production, the overall level of economic activity that is flowing through the circular model uh, of the economy or the level of exchange that's taking place at a particular point in time. And the term we use to measure the level of economic activity is called gross domestic product. Or as it's more familiarly referred to as GDP. This is the number you hear on the news. When they talk about the economy is growing by 2%, and we often come out with quarterly estimates of how the economy is doing in terms of production. When you hear these things in the newspaper about the economy has slowed down its rate of growth, or the economy is growing at 3%, or the economy grew at 2.2% uh, in the last quarter, this is the variable they're talking about. They're talking about gross domestic product. It's defined as the total dollar value of the final goods and services produced domestically per year. So it is a dollar value measure of the final goods and services Final meaning goods that are sold for their final purpose, not intermediate goods, but final sale of goods that are not incorporated into some other product. Produced domestically means it's a measure of production within the boundaries of the United States, and it's measured per year. As such, is what is called a flow variable. Flow variable means measured per unit time. So GDP is an amount per year, an amount of production per year. 
Notice that it's a dollar value. And so the way we actually calculate this estimate of the level of total economic activity is to sum up the total dollar value of each of the products being produced and then add them up to get a total dollar value for the economy. So you can visualize the calculation as the price of the Ford Taurus this year, the average price, times the quantity of Ford Taurus is produced gives me a dollar value plus the current price of GE radios times the quantity of GE radios produced this year plus the price of other domestic products that are being produced times the quantity of production this year on down over a list of goods and services produced domestically. Add all this up, and the total would be gross domestic product. It's a dollar value estimate of the level of production that's taking place. Now, another way to visualize this calculation, and it's important to see the shift in visualization for something we'll study uh, in about 20 minutes, is to visualize this as a vector of prices and a vector simply means an ordered list. Visualize this as an ordered list of prices, the current price for all of these products, times a vector of rates of production. Because remember, these are quantities produced per year. So you can visualize this definition as GDP is equal to the level of prices times a vector of real rates of production. And you add all that up to get a total dollar value of what the economy, in fact, has done during this particular period of time. P sub L stands for the price level. When you hear that term, the price level, think of just a whole series of prices that exist today. Quantity Q sub R means real output. Quantity means amount produced per time period. The R stands for real output. So Q sub R is a vector of the rates of production all these particular products in this particular year. So GDP is a dollar value estimate of the overall level of production in the economy. And the, the quick way of thinking about it is GDP equals the price level times the current rate of production. Now, because it is using the current level of prices, this is also called a nominal variable. The term nominal means measured in current prices. So gross domestic product is a nominal variable. And remember, it is a flow variable. So that's, that's the kind of measurement it is. It's nominal means it reflects the current level of prices in the economy. We use it as an estimate for the level of economic activity. And the question that may come to your mind is, well, how do you estimate that? How do you figure out what is actually being produced in this economy of 280 million people and tens of thousands of firms? How do we go about estimating that level of production? We use the estimation model of summing up the expenditures made by the various decision makers in the economy. So the estimation of GDP is the sum of the expenditures by the various decision making groups in the economy meaning the buyers, going back to our micro foundation, meaning the different buyers of the goods that are being produced. First category of buyers and the largest category of buyers are households. So the first element of our estimate of GDP is C, which stands for consumption, spending. And this is consumption decisions by households. 
and what would you say is the major factor that drives your consumption decisions? What's the major thing that determines how much you buy? Very good. How much you earn, right? The more you earn, the more you have available to spend, uh, and the more you tend to consume. So this element of our estimate is a function of the level of income flowing to households. Second category is investment spending by business firms. So here is a different group of decision makers. Investment spending refers to expenditures on buildings and equipment, which is called fixed investment. It also refers to changes in inventory. So investment spending is a decision made by business firms. Question, what factor would drive your decision as a firm of whether you want to invest in new buildings and equipment that are going to last for the next 10 years? You're a business firm. You're trying to decide upon how much to spend on investment, meaning buildings and equipment for this example. What would, what would determine your willingness to invest in that building for the next 10 years? Well, what is it business firms are trying to do? What's our assumption? Maximize profit. Good. So in deciding how much to invest today, going back to your micro foundations, the firm is going to be basing that decision on their estimates of future profits for the period of the investment over the next 10 years if the building is going to last for a 10-year period. So investment spending is based on expectations of future profits. We'll come back and talk about that somewhat later. Consumption plus investment. The third category is government spending. <coughs> Government spending is a policy variable. Well, two-thirds of government spending is determined by what are called entitlement programs, such as Social Security and Medicare. One-third of the national budget is discretionary spending by Congress. So Congress can choose to raise government spending or lower government spending uh, by passing various bills. And that's why it's called discretionary. That's why it's called policy variable. The fourth element of our estimate of GDP is net exports. And net exports is exports minus imports. And that is determined by domestic demand for foreign products and foreign demand for US products. It's also affected by changes in exchange rates between the currencies of the United States and other countries. So this is the way we estimate the level of economic activity. We add up estimates, obviously, of the level of levels of expenditures by uh, consumption by households, investment by firms, government spending, and net exports. The problem that arises in our measurement technique is that GDP is a nominal variable. And as such, if we look at a time series of numbers of GDP, they may or may not reflect a real change in the level of output. For example, if you saw a GDP time series that said in the year 2000, for some country, GDP was 100 billion. In the year 2001, it was 120 billion. In the year 2002, it was 140 billion. If you just look at those numbers, what does it look like is happening in that economy? It's growing. This would be good numbers, right? In fact, if you look at the numbers, it suggests that the economy grew by 20% in the year 2001, and then it grew by an additional 20 on a base of 120. Uh, 15, 18 percent, whatever that number is. So you'd say, wow, that country is really growing. That country is really growing over time. But then you think back to the way you made this calculation, and you recognize that rises in nominal GDP 
could in fact be reflecting more output, but they could also be reflecting what? Changes in the price level. See, GDP is the level of prices times the rate of output. So in fact, we want to find some way of measuring the changes that are taking place in real terms. We want to find some way of estimating what is the change in the level of prices and then use that as an adjustment to these nominal figures to figure out what's actually happening here. All right. Okay, so as a general rule, what we want to do is try to look at things in real terms. All right, it's very easy to be misled by the fact that dollar prices or dollar amounts seem to be going up. But you need to take into account the fact that that could just be because of the fact that prices are going up, perhaps, perhaps because of inflation. So we have a variety of different, what we call, price indices. A price index is designed to give you some idea of how much prices have risen over time. Uh, the most commonly used price index is called the CPI, or Consumer Price Index. C-P-I, Consumer Price Index. All right. Now, how is this constructed? Well, go back to what Professor Tons was saying a little while ago. Remember that you can think of prices and quantities as vectors. So, in a particular year, we have a variety of goods which are being sold, and this is the price of good number one, and this is the price of good number two, and this is the price of good number three, and so on, all the way to the end of good. All right, so we're selling all these different goods, and they all have different prices in some year. Let's say that this is the year 1996. All right, now there were also quantities that were purchased of all these goods in that year. So this is another vector right here. So we go Q1, Q2, Q3, all the way down to Qn. So these are the quantities of those goods that were purchased, again, in a particular year, 1996. Now, why am I picking 1996? Well, the reason is because we need to pick a base year. We need to talk about what year's prices we're going to get everything in terms of, sort of a starting point. And as it happens, I believe right now, currently, the year being used as the base year is 1996. So this is the year that we go back to, and we're trying to measure everything relative to what happened in 1996. All right? So what happened is consumers went, at, went and bought a certain basket of goods. And what we mean by a basket of goods is a, a collection the actual goods that were purchased by people. So they bought a certain number of Saturn cars, and they bought a certain number of compact discs, and they bought a certain number of pork chops, and so on. And that's what these quantities are. Now, what we do to measure the change in prices is then we look at a few years later. Say, it's a, say now it's a couple of years later. Now it's 1998, all right? And in 1998, we're going to look at what those prices are again. And so the government has a bunch of people who are actually paid to go out into grocery stores and so on and actually look at and record the prices of these goods. And we find a new set of prices. So again, we get P1, P2, P3, and so on, all the way down to Pn. Are these the same prices as these over here? No. no. They're prices for the same goods, but those prices may have gone up, they may have gone down, they're not the same. So it's a different vector, it's the 1998 vector of prices. <laughs> all right. So we have all these new prices here. Now, what are we going to do in order to figure out how much prices have gone up? Should we just add up all these prices and divide by n? No. That wouldn't make sense, because some of these goods we're buying a whole lot more of than others, and some of them we're hardly buying any of at all. Right. So what we need is some kind of a weighting system. The way they do it is they weight it using these quantities right here. So you multiply P1 times Q1 plus P2 times Q2 plus P3 times Q3 all the way to, down to Pn times Qn. All right. That gives us the total amount that we spent in the year 1996. Now, what we're going to multiply these numbers here times, you might think that we're going to multiply these times 1998 quantities. That's not what we're going to do. Because what we want to find out is, what if we bought exactly the same amount of goods that we bought in 1996? All right? So we're going to keep these same quantities, but multiply them times the new prices. So we're going to go like this. We have Q1, Q2, Q3, all the way down to Qn, and this is 1996 quantities. 
All right? So the point is, is we're saying, how much would it cost now to buy the same basket of goods that we bought back in 1996? All right? So I'm going to give you some quick labels for these things to make it easier. I'm going to call this vector P96. I'm going to call this vector here Q96. And if I put a dot between them, that means I'm doing this business of going P1 times Q1 plus P1 times Q2 and so on. All right? This right here I'm going to call P98. And this is still Q96. You guys follow me? All right. So in that case, here's how I construct a price index. I'm going to say that the price index, CPI, for the year 1998 is equal to P98 times Q96 divided by P96 times Q96. Now, you might look at this and think, oh, couldn't I just cancel the Q96? But the answer is no, because remember, this isn't simple multiplication. It's this multiplication where you're adding a bunch of multiplied things up, and you're not going to be able to just divide out like that. All right? Once you do this, you're going to find a number, and we're going to multiply it times 100. All right? Now, what kind of results is this going to generate for you? You get a table like this, all right? We're going to have a CPI table that's going to be for each year, all right? So we're going to have the year 1996, 1997, 1998, and so on, all right? Each time we're going to do it like this. Whatever year it is we're finding, that's going to affect our prices here, but all this other stuff remains the same, okay? So suppose that we were doing the year 1996. We have the CPAI for the year 1996. Then this right here would be P96 and, instead of P98, and therefore what would this fraction be? We have P96 times Q96 over P96 times Q96. What's that going to be? One. All right? And then we multiply that times 100, and so we get this. In the base year, the CPI is always 100. All right? But in subsequent years, we're going to be substituting different set of prices. So we'll keep on plugging a different set of prices in here, and it'll be whatever the prices are for this year. Okay? So in the year 1997 and 1998, some prices may have gone up, some prices might have gone down, but if there's any inflationary pressure, you expect probably the net effect will have been for prices to go up, right? So what that means is that in future years, the ratio is going to be higher than 1. So in my, maybe in the year 1997, we get 102. And maybe in the year 1998, we get 105, right? Now, how do you interpret these numbers? What does 102 mean about the prices in 1997 relative to 1996? They've gone up 2%. What does 105 mean? Prices have done what? Increased by 5% since when? Since 1996, all right? So does this tell you the inflation rate? Is this number, knock off 100, does that tell you the inflation rate? No, because inflation rate is year to year. So from 1996 to 1997, the inflation rate was how much? 2%. But in order to find the inflation rate for 90, from 97 to 98, what do you do? You get a calculator, and what do you do? What do you do with that calculator? Divide what by what? Uh, one, no, actually. All right. How much did it change? Three, but it's not. It's three points, not three percent, right? We take three over one hundred two as our base, and that would give you the actual inflation rate for nineteen ninety seven to nineteen ninety eight. Okay. Now, oh, sorry. Do the formula behind it. All right. So the formula behind it. Point. All right. So you'll take the CPI for the new year, all right, so we'll call that 1, minus the CPI for the previous year, call that 0, divide by the CPI for the previous year, and this is going to give you the inflation rate. And that is the percentage change. All right, and in terms of a percentage change. All right, now what would we do with the CPI? Well, what we can do is use it to be able to compare dollar values in different years. If you heard somebody say, 
that they were making forty-five thousand dollars five years ago, and they're making five thousand, uh, they're making fifty thousand dollars now. Do you think they're richer now? They're making more money now. Maybe, maybe not, right? It all depends on the inflation rate. So what are you going to do? What you do is you try to put everything in terms of constant years, all right? So one thing we could do is take each of those two years and put them in terms of a constant year's dollars, like 1996, all right? So say that we had an individual who was making $45,000 in 1997, and in 1998, they were making $50,000. One thing we could do is convert these both to $1996. So I would divide 45,000 by what? To get it in terms of $1996. Right. I'm gonna divide by the CPI for this year, for 1997, all right? So I'll take 45,000, divide it by 102. Anybody got a calculator? Right. What's the answer calculation? Well, it, it, no, no, there are two ways to do <laughs> this, and, and, we, yeah. and we both do it different ways. I mean, they, they come out of the same answer. Don't get excited. Same answer. <laughs> but I think it's easier to think in this way. To find this in real terms, which is what Dr. Whitman's talking about, what I would do is divide this nominal amount over the CPI divided by 100, because this actually gives me the actual ratio of the change in prices. So to find the real amount, Divide by the CPI index value over 100, and that will give me real. So the calculation of nominal to real is, in fact, this calculation. So for 1997... Uh, let me interrupt you. Yeah, go ahead. What he's saying is just look at it like this. Put in a decimal point in your CPI like that, right. and then divide by that number. All right? So let's say, anybody got a calculator? Pull out the calculator. Do it for me. Okay. 45,000 <laughs> divided by 1.02 gives us what? 45,117. All right. And now let's look at 1998. They're making $50,000 in there, but we're going to divide by 1.05. Can you give me that number? 47,619. All right. 47,619. All right. So now we see that their income has, in fact, risen, but not as much as you might have thought. It seemed like it went up by $5,000. But when you put it into real terms, it turns out it hasn't gone up so much because of the fact that there was some inflation from 1997 to 1998. All right? All right. I think that covers us on that topic. That's good. Well, I'm going to go right to interest rates now. On, this, on the same kind of measurement, we talked about the interest then in expressing the relationship between nominal and real. And Dr. Whitman's just gone through that adjustment process for you. The way it's adjusted is by using the CPI. And this is the kind of calculation you might anticipate seeing on a test question referring to this particular topic. In the same light, as we think about transactions over time, we recognize that the interest rate is, in fact, the premium paid for the earlier availability of goods. As we think about borrowing and lending money, or as we think about those kinds of transactions that involve an exchange over time, the interest rate really is the premium you pay to get things sooner. You know, you could buy a car by saving up and acquiring a, a bunch of money in your account, and then after you have the money, you can go to the dealer and hand him the dollar price of the car, and you receive the car. But it might take you five years to put all that money aside. You want the car when? Okay. Now. Good. So you're willing to pay a premium above the purchase price of the car to get the car sooner. And the premium is the interest rate for borrowing that particular amount. Good. Well, the interest rates we observe in the economy are, again, nominal variables. Remember, nominal means in terms of current prices. Nominal means what you see. Everything out there is nominal. The interest rates are nominal. It's what, the, what they actually are. But now we want, we're interested in thinking about how that interest rate is influenced by expectations of inflation. So I want to think about the relationship between nominal interest rates and real interest rates. Well, here's the example. 
Suppose I'm willing to lend money at 5%. Uh, I want 5% uh, back from lending you this $1,000 for a one-year time period. Well, that means I want an extra $50 of purchasing power after the one year is over. You all with me? 5% of $1,000 is $50. I'll lend you the $1,000 today, but I want you to pay me back $1,050. The reason is I want $50 more purchasing power next year to compensate for the use of my money. And Thomas, no, your name is? What? Thomas, you moved, though. You were sitting back there before. Good. So, Thomas, you're willing to pay 5% premium, you with me, to borrow the money. I'm willing to lend the money at 5%. So we have a deal, right? Uh, and the exchange would take place. He's willing to lend and pay an, I'm sorry, I'm willing to lend and receive an additional 5%. He's willing to borrow and pay an additional 5% back. Now, we're about to enter into the contract, and then I read in the papers that inflation is now expected to be 3% over this next year. You all with me? I read now that over the next year we anticipate inflation of 3%. Well, I stop and think about it and I think, well, wait a minute. If I lend him $1,000 today, he's going to have the money now. I won't get the money back until a year from now. And then the dollars he pays me back won't buy as much because prices have gone up in the meantime. So when I think about the interest rate I'm willing to engage in when I lend the money to you, I'm going to think about the underlying real interest I want to earn, which was 5% more purchasing power, but I'm also going to look at anticipated inflation. So now when I go to lend the money, I'm only willing to lend it if I get 5% for the real compensation and 3% more to cover the change in the value of the dollars. Very good. So the nominal interest rate in the economy, the nominal rate means what we observe out there, equals some kind of underlying real interest rate plus the anticipated change in prices. Nominal interest rate equals the real rate plus the anticipated change in prices. Another way of solving a relationship over time is to look backward. Another relationship I'm interested in is, how did I do on a past transaction? This is what's called ex post, looking back at a particular situation. So let's think of the following situation. I lent money to Esther at 10%. So the nominal interest rate was what? 10%. Remember, nominal means what's actually out there. Good. I lent money to Esther at 10%. Uh, a year ago, uh, and I get back the amount I loan plus 10% more. And so I want to see how I did in terms of this particular time period. Well, I look back over the time period, and it turns out that inflation over that year was 7%. You all with me? Good. I let the money out at 10% a year ago, so I got 10% more dollars back, and I'm feeling pretty good about that. Then I look back and I see, wait a minute though, prices went up by 7%. How much did I actually earn? 3%. 3%. Very good. And that's the same relationship except looking backward. And the answer then would be, or the, the relationship would be real equals nominal, very good, minus the inflation rate. Notice the distinction. Looking forward, it's an anticipated rate. Looking backward, it's the actual rate. As usual with these kind of things, you can do it in any order you want, right? If it's a relationship between three things, we can give you any two of them, right. and you have to figure out the other one. So if we say, here's the real, here's the nominal interest rate, what must inflation have been during that year? All right? Or we say, here's the real, here's the inflation rate, what was the nominal interest rate during that year or during that period of time? So always be able to manipulate the equation. Good. All right. Um, shall I talk about employment, or shall you? Doesn't matter. I'll do it. We said that macroeconomics is the study of the entire economic system, so there are several things we want to be able to measure in that process. We've talked so far about how to measure the level of activity, gross domestic product. We've talked about how to measure the level of inflation through the consumer price index. 
I also refer you to the notes. There's an alternative calculation for the GDP deflator, which is similar but covered in uh, the notes. We're also interested in how much of the uh, people are working. Uh, we're interested in studying the level of utilization of labor in the system. We'd like an economic system in which people seeking jobs can find jobs easily. That would be desirable to you if you're looking for work, that it would be easy to find a job. So one of the measures that is used to study the operation of the system is to measure the level of unemployment that exists in the economy. And to understand that measurement, I want to go back and define a couple terms first. The first is, as we think of the entire economy, we think first of all of the population, meaning the total number of people in the country. Total number today is approximately 280 million people, 280 million people. But as we study the operation of the economy, we recognize that many of those people are not productive in the sense of working through the exchange system. Some of them are very young, right? One-year-old, two-year-olds, and so forth. But they're not very productive workers, are they? They, they produce a lot of byproducts <laughs> and a lot of joy and not material goods for their parents. Stories to tell uh, at the office. You won't believe what Morgan did this morning, etc. Uh, but they don't produce a lot of economic goods and services. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have a lot of people who are what? Who are very old, right? And, and they're not very productive, are they? And the way society is changing, they keep hanging around for longer and longer periods, don't they? <laughs> I mean, medical changes are such that they, we're keeping these people alive for a lot longer than they used to be. But they're not productive members at this time. So we want to take the total population of 280 million and separate out the portion of it that is either seeking work or currently employed. And we call that the labor force. So out of the total population, the portion of all those people who are either actively working now or actively seeking work is called the labor force. Think of those as the available people to work uh, in the e economic system. Good. Now, that number, by the way, today is about 132 million people. So out of our 280 million, about 132 million is the size of the active labor force in the United States. So that's the group that's either working or actively seeking work. The unemployment rate is measured as a percentage of the labor force that is not currently employed but is seeking work. So this percentage that you hear quoted does not deal with the population. It deals with the percentage of the labor force that is not currently employed but is actively seeking work. So there's a measurement, potential <coughs> measurement question for you there on size of the population, labor force, participation rates, etc. Now, what are the various reasons for people being unemployed? Meaning, is all unemployment bad? And the answer is no. In any dynamic economy, or any dynamic exchange process, there's always some percentage of the good, in this case labor, that's not currently uh, uh, being exchanged. Stop and think about it. As you graduate from Northridge, will you necessarily be employed the first day you start looking for a job? The answer is no. In fact, my response to you is if you are employed the very first day you started looking, you took the wrong job, <laughs> right? Because you just took the first thing that came along. The average period of search today in the United States is estimated to be about one month per $10,000 of salary. So the expected search time, the expected period of search to find the right job is approximately one month per $10,000 of salary. If you're going out looking for a job and expecting to earn around $30,000, the average search time is about three months. It takes time to get your resume together, to get online, check monster.com, talk to the placement office, go to job fairs, all of these search activities to try and find work. So those people will be unemployed for a period of time. As they're in the labor force now, they're now seeking work, but they're not yet employed. Good. Secondly, in any dynamic system, some people will be changing jobs. Dee Dee works for a firm for several years, and then he decides it's time to move on. He wants to find a new job. Or, in fact, he's been laid off because of factors that affect just that particular firm. Good. 
So there's always going to be people in a state of flux, either people entering the system or people switching between the various job opportunities. By the way, the estimates are that for your generation, you will hold approximately six to eight jobs during your life cycle of employment. Six to eight different positions, different jobs. Not bookkeeper one, bookkeeper two, but actually totally different jobs. You may get your law degree, you may practice law for a few years, and then become a, a, a legal counsel for a firm. And from that, you could move into marketing, or you could move into something else. You may be an engineer for a number of, of, of a period of time, go back and get an MBA degree from an excellent program offered here at Cal State Northridge, and then become a manager of some kind uh, in the firm. So people are switching jobs, people are entering the labor force. That is referred to as frictional unemployment, a natural element of the economic system. Frictional unemployment, people entering the job market or switching jobs. Secondly, in a dynamic economic system like the United States, the system changes gradually over time. There are, in fact, structural changes to where the jobs are available. In the early 1900s, the United States, as you know, was primarily an, a, a, an agricultural economy. Uh, something like 70% of the population was engaged in growing of food and distribution and processing of food products. That number is now down to about 2% of the population. Even though we're producing much more food than we did in the early 1900s, only about 2% of the labor force is working in that particular area. The United States moved from an agrarian economy to a manufacturing economy, and we have more recently in the last 20 years moved from a manufacturing economy to a service economy. So as the economy changes and the structure of the system changes, some people will be unemployed along the way. As there's declining demand for cotton manufacturing because of better products being imported from Korea, uh, those people will be temporarily unemployed. And that is part of what's called structural unemployment, also a natural part of the system. Secondly, within the structure of the economy, there are various laws that may in fact prevent everyone from getting a job who would like to find work. And so that is also part of the economic structure of the economy, such laws as minimum wage laws. You studied in micro indicate that those may in fact cause degrees of unemployment, particularly for subsets of the population. So that would be part of the structural unemployment of the economy. Those two categories together make up what's called the natural rate. It's to be expected. Some percent would be unemployed in the economy. The problem kind of unemployment is this last category, which is called cyclical unemployment. And cyclical unemployment means people who are unemployed because the overall economic system has slowed down. The overall level of production and exchange has slowed down for some reason, leading to less demand for labor, leading to people finding it harder to get jobs in the economy, and therefore being unemployed for a longer period of time. So that is called cyclical unemployment. It is, a it is the result of what is called the business cycle. And the business cycle, remember, refers to changes in the growth rate of gross domestic product. During recessionary periods, downturns in economic growth, some people can't find jobs or some people are laid off and are unemployed for a period of time. So those are the three categories uh, of unemployment. The first two, as I said, make up the natural rate. Cyclical unemployment is the kind we'd like to deal with with government policy. Yes? So what we experienced in the past like two years here, would that be cyclical unemployment? Yes. Okay. The changes would be cyclical unemployment. It's kind of interesting. The natural rate was thought of for a very long time historically as being around 6%. Uh, in the late 90s, we got down to unemployment rates of 4.52%. And some of the economists were like, how is that possible? The natural rate is 6%. How can we possibly get down to that? Well, we recognize that there are structural changes that have taken place that now make it easier to find jobs. So the search period is shorter. When you look for jobs today, you have the internet available. And you all understand, and in fact are utilizing that efficiency. 
You can get your resume out to thousands of firms, and they can get their job openings out to hundreds of thousands of potential employees. Search engines can do searches through all your resumes and send them a list of the 100 top qualified people. You can use search engines to work in reverse. So we anticipate a fall in the natural rate, but the recent change in the unemployment rate is most likely cyclical unemployment. All right, loanable funds. Okay, so we've been talking about uh, interest rates over here, but now we want to talk a little bit about how it is that interest rates are actually determined. And the model that we use for understanding the determination of interest rates is actually the same model that we use for the determination of any other form of price. An interest rate is a price, right? It's the price that you pay in order to be able to borrow some money that you don't have for some period of time. And it's also the price that you get paid if you're somebody who's actually lending money to others. So the interest rate is in fact a, a form of price and it's determined like most prices by supply and demand. All right, so as usual, we have a supply and demand graph like so. In this case, what are we going to have on the axes here? Well, this is the price axis, but in this case, we're talking about what? The interest rate, all right? So interest rate R, all right? And over here, we're talking about quantity, but what is the quantity that we're talking about? It's quantity of dollars loaned to people on the loanable funds market, all right? So this is the market in which the people making loans and the borrowers are interacting, all right? So where does the demand for loanable funds come from? Who demands loanable funds? Who demand, who wants to borrow? Right. We have individuals, right? We have individuals who want to use their credit cards in order to be able to purchase goods before they can afford them, right? You get them a little bit early, right? We're talking about car buyers, right? Individuals who are trying to buy a home, all right? These are all forms of demand for loanable funds, all right? Also, very important source is firms. Firms often want to borrow money in order to make investments, all right? And that's actually the more important part of the demand for loanable funds, all right, is the firms that are out there trying to borrow money in order to make, uh, make investments. All right, on the other side, what we have is the supply and who's supplying money to the loanable funds market. All right, banks, but they're actually intermediators, intermediaries. Who's coming first? Who's actually supplying the dollars? All right, government can do it, do it but who, who's actually getting paid? Who actually ends up making the money? People who are saving, right? Individuals like you, if you are choosing to consume less than you buy, uh, excuse, less than you earn, then in that case, those are dollars that you're putting into the bank or into savings accounts or into IRAs, and you're earning money on them, right? So anybody who has money that they're putting into the system to try to uh, earn interest on, that's somebody who's on the supply side here. And yes, they often do it through banks and other intermediaries, but ultimately they are the people who are supplying the funds that are going to be available. All right? So we have supply and demand for loanable funds. As usual, we get an equilibrium. All right? So we get an equilibrium interest rate, RE, and we get an equilibrium quantity, QE. So this is going to be the interest rate that occurs. Remember, we're talking about, actually, theoretically, we should be talking about the nominal interest rates. I'm just going to change that. All right. So this is the actual interest rate that we observe on the market, I. All right. And this is the actual quantity of dollars that end up getting loaned on the loanable funds market. All right. You can analyze this market just like any other supply and demand market. All right. So suppose that I said that the government gave people additional incentives uh, to make investments, right? They started encouraging firms to make greater investments, such as by cutting their taxes on new investments and so on. What would that do in this picture? Shift what to the where? Okay. Who, what are these firms doing? They're giving the firms an incentive to do what? To make investments. What do they have to do in order to make investments? 
they have to borrow money. They have to borrow money in order to make investments. So what side of the market are we talking about here? The demand side. Suppose that the government gives these demanders of loanable funds, these firms, an incentive to do more investments than they were doing before. Then what's going to happen here? We're going to get a shift of demand. Which way? To the right. To the right. What effect do we expect that to have on the equilibrium? We're going to have a higher interest rate. Okay, It's going to push up the interest rate. And we're going to have a larger amount of funds being loaned on the market. Right? Okay? We could do the same thing in the other way. Suppose that they suddenly started taxing uh, returns on investments more. Okay, well, actually, that wouldn't affect that demand side. All right? Let's look at the supply side. All right? What if it's the case that the government decides that they're going to start having a higher tax on interest income? What's that going to do? Higher tax on interest income. All right. That means you will not be as inclined to supply money for purposes of loaning to others because you'll be getting less back, right? What side of the market are we talking about? All right. Now we're talking about the supply side. You as an individual or other, other person who is supplying funds to the market, you'll be less inclined to do so. So as a result of that, that will tend to shift the supply curve which direction? To the left, like so. So if we're comparing to this original position, so we're not looking at the new demand curve, we're looking at the old one, then in that case, we're going to get a higher interest rate, again, compared to this original position, and we're going to get a smaller amount of funds being loaned on the market. Is this clear to everyone? All right. If you ever have any confusion about this, just remember, it's just supply and demand with an unusual kind of price. All right? And then make sure you're careful about thinking who it is that wants funds. In other words, who is a borrower and who is a lender? Because you can have firms on the demand side, which may be something that you're not used to, but they are actually the primary borrowers on the loanable funds market. <coughs> All right. Any questions about this? Good. Equation of exchange? Yeah. All right. We've talked about the um, importance of interest rates being the price of earlier availability of goods. And we've demonstrated with this discussion the general factors that influence the current level of interest rates. We had talked about the anticipated inflation effect previous to that. The amount of money in the system is also critical. We've said this is an exchange system where you trade dollars to get goods. So clearly, just in thinking about it, the amount of money in the system is critical because it's what is used for the purchases of trade. If you woke up tomorrow morning and suddenly there was no money in the economy, meaning no checkable deposits, no currency in your pocket, what would happen to the overall economic system? You'd go to work tomorrow, your name is... Kristen, you go to work tomorrow, and Kristen, your boss, would say, Kristen, it's great to see you, but we have no money to pay you. <laughs> what would you do? Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. After reading off a list of things you wanted to say to him. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. In the other direction, you can also visualize the following. If suddenly a helicopter flew over the village and dumped out large amounts of currency, so everybody went out there and gathered up large amounts of currency. What would you try and do with it? You'd try and buy stuff, right? It's a windfall, right? You just won the lottery from the sky. And everybody got, you know, hundreds of thousands or thousands of dollars. Well, you'd all go out and try and spend those dollars immediately. Michelle, right? Good. Now, stop and think. You have an orange tree. You grow oranges. You sell oranges at a certain price. All of a sudden, all these extra people come in and want to buy your oranges. What do you realize you can do? You can raise price now because now you realize that there's a lot more people willing to pay the current price than there are oranges available. Very good. So a generalization would be the following. If there's not enough money in the system, the system's going to have to slow down because money is what's necessary for exchange to take place. If there's too much money in the system, that in fact we can anticipate inflation. If I give you all lots of dollars to spend, in your attempt to spend them for a certain rate of production, prices are going to get bid up. Now, what is the actual relationship in terms of theory? 
Well, it has to do with what is called the equation of exchange. Clearly, it has to be the case that the number of dollars that are spent in a year, the number of dollars that are actually traded for goods, has to be equal to the dollar value of what is purchased. If you go to Ralph's and you put together a basket full of $107 worth of groceries, how much must you give them for it? The price tag on your basket is $107. Price times quantity for all the things you have in your basket. How much do you have to pay them? $107, good. So the number of dollars spent must in fact be equal to the dollar value of what is purchased. It's true for you at Ralph's, it's also true for the overall economy. So that's why I put three lines here. It's in fact a tautology or an identity. Number of dollars spent must be equal to the dollar value of what is purchased. Well, if we look at the total dollar value of what's being produced and exchanged, that's gross domestic product. If we look at the total dollars that are being spent, we can calculate that as the number of dollars in the system, which is called the money supply or the money stock, times the average number of times those dollars get spent. And that is called the velocity of money. The word velocity means what to you? Speed, good. So the velocity of money means the speed at which money is spent in a year. You all with me? We're going to see in a minute that money is created when banks make loans. Money is actually created when banks make loans. New money occurs at that time. If I make a loan to Kristen in January, the idea is that you're not going to leave it in your checking account. You're going to spend it. And you might spend it, the $5,000 you've borrowed, and pay Esther for some, for some product she's produced. So those dollars have been used once in January. When they get into Esther's checking account, what's Esther going to do? She's going to use it to buy things. Good. So you write a $3,000 check to uh, Ruslan uh, for the work that he did on your particular contract. So the dollars are used a second time for that transaction. Ruslan takes $1,000 out in currency and goes to Vegas and uses those $1,000 for another transaction there. So the velocity means the average number of times a dollar is used during a year. The average number of transactions in which that dollar is used during a year. Good. So you can see for the economy then that the number of dollars in the system times the average number of times they're spent has to be equal to the dollar price tag of what is in fact being purchased. Now so far that's just a tautology which means it is always true. To make it into a theory, we have to make an assumption. And the assumption we make is the following. If, in fact, velocity doesn't change much from year to year in the short run, if, in fact, the velocity of money is relatively stable, so from year to year, dollars you know, are spent about the same number of times, then we notice something about the relationship. If velocity is stable, meaning this, we put a bar over it to represent stable, then a change here has to lead to what? Let me make it more clear. An increase here has to lead to what? An increase here. And in fact, in the strong form, if in fact velocity is stable, a percentage increase here has to lead to a proportional percentage increase on the right-hand side. So we're now seeing the linkage between money in the system and the level of nominal economic activity. And we see there is a linkage between the amount of money in the system and the level of nominal GDP. The question that comes up next, however, is when you increase the amount of money in the system, does the increase on the right-hand side change the price level or does it change the real rate of output? The next part of this analysis would be to recognize that putting more money in, if velocity is stable, will raise nominal GDP. But the question is, will it in fact cause a growth in real GDP, or will it simply cause a growth in the price level? Well, the answer to that has to do with what factors determine the ability of the economy to grow. 
What are the things that allow the economy to grow in real terms over time? And I'm going to put this up as a summary uh, relationship due to the constraint of time on us, but this again is covered in the review notes. The ability of the, out of the economy to grow, the potential percentage change in real output, is a function of the various inputs to the production process. So for the economy to grow in real output, it depends upon changes in the level of natural resources. That would allow more production if you have more natural resources. Changes in the size of the labor supply. Changes in what we'll call human capital, which is the productivity of labor. Changes in technology of production. The real rate of growth of the economy is determined by underlying changes in real factors in the economy, such as additional resources, additional labor, rising productivity of labor, or changes in technology. So if money growth is more excessive than the real potential growth of output, you're going to end up with inflation. Or to put it in a simple way, sustained inflation in the economy is always the result of excessive monetary growth. Sustained inflation, and this is the result of studies over time, is always the result of excessive monetary growth. All right. Um, I think it, it might actually make more sense to go directly from here to uh, That's good. Stuff. And I'll come back to that. And then come back to that. Good. All right. So, now we're going to talk about some of the ways that this effect might not happen immediately. All right? Because if you just looked at this equation of exchange and you figured that the velocity was constant and you figured that this quantity here, the actual real output of the economy, was also constant as determined by all of these underlying factors, then it might lead you to believe that any increase in the money supply is just going to automatically translate into prices immediately and that's it with no effect on the economy. But there are a variety of theories out there that contend that it's possible that it is, it is possible for the government to affect the actual level of output of the economy if the economy is in a recession because of some short run effects. So I'm going to show you one of those models that explains how that could possibly be the case. That's good. All right. What we use is the aggregate demand, aggregate supply framework. All right. Uh, this, uh, this pen isn't working. Yeah. Here's some. Use the back width. All right. So this aggregate demand supply and aggregate supply framework will look very familiar to you. All right. When you look at it, it's going to look just like the supply and demand that you do in microeconomics the supply and demand that we did just a few minutes ago with the loanable funds market. But what you have to remember is the appearances are deceptive. It looks the same, but the meaning behind everything is actually very, very different. The reasons why these curves have the shapes that they do are also very different from the way they are in the microeconomic context. I'm going to explain why in a minute. But what we're going to put here is the price level here, but no longer are we talking about the price of an individual good, but we're talking about the price level for the economy as a whole, all right? You can think of it as being like the CPI or some other measure of the overall price level. Down here, we're going to be looking at real output, okay? We're going to have a downward sloping demand curve that we're going to call aggregate demand, and this represents consumers' demands for all of the different things that they would be inclined to buy, depending upon the price that they are actually facing in the economy as a whole. Now, let me emphasize here that this is not the same as the regular demand curve, because if you think about a regular demand curve in the context of a particular product, the reason why it's true that a lower price will cause you to buy more of it is mainly a result of the fact that this good is now cheaper relative to other goods. All right. So if the price of CDs goes down, you might buy more of CDs and less of some other things like going to concerts. All right. But here we're not talking about just one good. We're talking about all the goods. 
All right. So in that case, it's not possible for you to be talking about a substitution from one good to another when the price goes down because we're talking about a general drop in the price level. So that doesn't make any sense anymore, right? Now, if you go into your notes online, you'll find three different reasons why the aggregate demand would, we would expect it to be downward sloping, even though we don't have that substitution effect. I'm going to tell you just one of them right now, but I encourage you to go read the rest. One of them is a pure wealth effect. If people are getting a certain amount of money in their salaries, then in that case, when the price goes down, their dollars will go further. It just simply means that they're able to get more with the amount of dollars they have in their pockets. So they feel a greater wealth, and as a result of that, they're going to be going out and purchasing more. All right? So that's one of the reasons why the aggregate demand would be sloping downward. All right? Now I'm going to talk about aggregate supply. Now, aggregate supply, not surprisingly, is going to slope upward, but I'm going to label this short-run aggregate supply. And this is very important because you might think, okay, it makes perfect sense that with higher prices, people are going to be willing to supply more. That's using microeconomic logic, but it's actually, again, not the justification for the shape of this curve, all right? Because you might think, okay, higher prices, they're going to be willing to supply more of whatever product they're producing. Firms are going to be willing to produce more. Until you realize, wait a minute, the prices of everything else went up too, right? This is a general price level. So it's also going to indicate that it's going to cost more for them to get their labor, more for them to get their capital, more for them to get their resources, more for them to get their say, other sources of supply, right? So the point is, is that if your costs of production are raise, uh, rising at the same time that your prices for your output are rising, that doesn't mean you're going to produce more necessarily. All right? So we can't use that justification for the aggregate supply curve being upward sloping. We need a different justification. And in fact, in the long run, we don't think it's going to be true that it's upward sloping. In fact, what it's going to be is vertical, just like this. All right? Our long run aggregate supply is usually hypothesized to be vertical. And what does that mean? All right? It's vertical at some real level of output that's determined by all of the things that Professor Taunts up here had just a minute ago, where he said, sorry? Yeah, it, until he just erased it, right? <laughs> Remember he said, look, the real level of output in the economy is determined by a variety of real things, like the actual number of people in the country, and the actual amount of natural resources we have, and the actual technology that we have available to us, all right? And shifts in how much people or how little people are willing to buy is not, are not ultimately going to affect that. All right. If you think about, if you ignore for a minute this short-run aggregate supply here, what's going to happen if people start wanting to buy more? We have a shift outward of the aggregate demand, uh, aggregate demand curve. Is that going to affect the actual amount the economy can produce? No. That's going to stay the same. So what will be the only effect? Price. The only effect is going to be on price. I'll show you that effect right here. I draw in an aggregate supply, uh, demand curve that's shifted out. Ignore the short run aggregate supply curve. In the long run, what's going to happen is the quantity stays the same and the price just rises from here to here. That is essentially the effect that Professor Tons was talking about just a minute ago when he was talking about the equation of exchange. If you imagine the government increased the amount of the money supply in order to make people want to buy more, put more money into people's pockets so that they'll buy more, in the long run, that's just like dumping money over people with a helicopter. They get more money in their pockets, but then they go out and just find the prices are, just, are a lot higher as well. So they're only buying as much as they did before. That's the long run effect. Okay? However, there are reasons to believe that in the short run that may not be true. Here we have a short run aggregate supply curve that does show a willingness of firms to be willing to produce more as the price gets higher. Why, Why would that be? What possible justification could we have for that? Again, this is something where the notes online are going to give you several different explanations, but I'm going to summarize them like so. The basic idea is that in the short run, it's possible to fool people. In the short run, it's possible to fool people. So the idea is this. Suppose the government does something to increase demand for products, such as, for instance, increasing the money supply so people have more money in their pockets to go out and spend. All right? The first effect of that is going to be to cause the prices that are being received for output by firms to rise. 
But in the short run, the amount that they are paying in wages and that they're paying for their other factors of production might be fixed because they have a long-term wage contract. Or it might just be that the firm doesn't realize yet that those prices are rising. They see that they're getting higher prices for their output. They don't see that their costs of production are rising yet because you fooled them, right? And so for a little while, they say, hey, great, my prices are going up for my output relative to how much I'm paying to produce. Great, I'm going to go ahead and produce more. And that's why you have, or one of the reasons why you have this upward sloping shape to the short run aggregate supply curve. Now, what does that mean? That means that in the short run, it's possible for government policy to have an effect, all right? Because in the short run, if the government does something to pump up aggregate demand, what's that going to do? It's going to move us out to a point like this, right? Prices go up a little bit, but quantity goes up as well, all right? So quantity jumps up for a little while, all right? But then people begin to realize that they were fooled. Firms start to realize that their costs are rising as well as their prices rising. And as a result of that, we end up sliding right back up here to the long run equilibrium. Does everybody see that? So this is essentially the effect you expect to see from essentially a shock created by government policy. In the short run, you have an effect on output and price. But in the long run, all of the effect is felt on price. Now, yeah, that's what I'm going to. All right, so now why would the government want to do that? Why would the government want to uh, be affecting things in this way? Well, the main reason they'd want to do it is if for some reason the economy were below this long-run equilibrium amount of output. So I'm going to draw a new picture here rather than messing with this one again. All right, I'll just draw a new one right over here. All right. So, let's see. <coughs> Right? Let's suppose that for some reason there has been a drop in consumer confidence. 9-11 came along or something like that. And that caused suddenly people's confidence in the economy to drop dramatically. All right? Now, in the long run, that shouldn't matter because of the fact that we still have this vertical long run aggregate supply curve. So that would just mean the price level would drop, but the quantity would remain the same. But in the short run, it can have an effect because of this fooling the firms effect. All right? So the result of that could be that we have an aggregate demand down here. So we've got short run aggregate supply and aggregate demand at this spot right here, which is less than the economy's long run level of output. And it would be nice if we were at that long run level of output, because at that long run level of output, that's where we have no cyclical unemployment. That's where the only unemployment is the natural rate of unemployment that we would expect in a healthy economy. When we're below that level, the economy isn't as healthy as it could be, right? You're in a recession. When you're at this spot right here, I'll call this Q short run, right? You're at this low level of output. That means you have a recession, you have unemployment, and all the bad effects that go with that. So in the long run, we think eventually we're going to adjust back to here. The economy will do it, its, uh, do it on its own. But the problem is, is that the short run matters to a lot of people, right? In the short run, people are going through hardship. And it would be nice if we could get there fast, get back there faster. So the idea is the government uses a variety of tools to try to get us back there faster. And one of the things that they can do is using fiscal or monetary policy. Fiscal policy is when the legislature acts to use their budget in order to affect aggregate demand. All right. So maybe this would be when something like the tax cut package that's being proposed right now. One of the justifications for that current tax package, a tax cut package, and people have argued against this, but at least one of the stated justifications is cutting taxes is going to put more money back in people's pockets. That's going to give consumers more confidence, and it's going to kick up aggregate demand. So the idea would be to try to push aggregate demand back up like this using this fiscal stimulus, all right? Does that make sense to everyone? All right. Now, another way that you could try to do the same thing is instead of using fiscal policy, you use monetary policy. Monetary policy is controlled by the Federal Reserve through its manipulation of the money supply. 
and Professor Tons will give you more details about this, but I want to put it in this framework for you as sort of a preview, which is that by manip manipulating the money supply, making it a larger money supply, the idea is to put more money in people's pockets. As you put more money in people's pockets, what's that going to do? It's going to shift aggregate demand out in this way. Now, usually the way that works is by putting more money out there, what they do is they lower the interest rate. When the interest rate is lower, firms are going to be more willing to make investments, right? Lower interest rate firms make more investments. As a result, they start hiring more people. As a result, they start paying them salaries. And by paying those people salaries or paying them larger salaries, we shift out the aggregate demand in this way, all right? So the idea is, is that this framework is correct. If the short run aggregate supply is different from the long run aggregate supply, that means you can have, that it's possible for government fiscal policy and monetary policy to have an effect in the short run on the real output of the economy. And that means it's at least conceivable for the government to be able to try to get us out of a recession more quickly. All right? Good. The government's goal, as we've talked about, is to generate an economic system that has a low level of unemployment, that has a stable level of prices over time, that promotes real growth and output over time, and that provides for stability in interest rates, financial asset prices, and foreign exchange rates. Those are kind of a summary of five goals for the macro economy. What we've been talking about in this last discussion is ways the government can interfere or ways the government can step in to affect the operation of that economic system. And Dr. And, uh, uh, Dr. Whitman has talked about two ways to, for the government to step into the operation of the economy, through fiscal policy and through monetary policy. Fiscal policy is determined by Congress. Fiscal policy has two elements to it, changes in taxation or changes in government spending. So you want to review how both of those can change aggregate demand and respond to uh, uh, the situation of recession as we talked about. Monetary policy is conducted by the central bank, and the central bank of the economy is called the Federal Reserve System. There are details on the website notes with respect to the basic functions of the Fed, but they are laid out primarily as providing check-clearing facilities for banks, providing financial soundness in the banking system, and controlling the money supply. The structure of the Fed is laid out in the notes, and I won't go through that at this time, but I do want to talk about the policy tools available to the Fed and how those policy tools are used to implement the monetary policy that we've been talking about. First of all, we want to recognize that money in the system consists of currency in circulation plus the checkable deposits within the banking system. So I've put up on this diagram over here a balance sheet for the operation of a commercial bank. We see in their liabilities area the checkable deposits, which is your checking account, which they owe to you. That's why it's on the liability side. And the money supply in the economy consists of the current level of checkable deposits within the banks plus currency, which is out in circulation. So here is the money stock we talked about in the quantity theory of money. A bank operates as a financial intermediary between borrowers and lenders. We talked about that in, in terms of interest rate formation. And a bank holds various categories of assets. They hold vault cash for the purposes of serving you as a customer. They also hold money on deposit up at the Fed. So your, each bank, which is a private firm, holds some deposits or some monies on deposit up at the Federal Reserve. The bank also holds certain government bonds as a source of income. But the major source of income for the bank, as you are well aware, is the loans that the bank makes. This is their source of 
profitability. And again, it's important for you to remember these are just profit maximizing firms. They'd like you to think they are different than other firms, but they're not. They're just out there trying to maximize profits. How do they acquire funds to make these particular loans? Well, they accept your checkable deposits. That's a source of funding for them. They also sell certificates of deposit, as you know. And when you buy a certificate, you deposit money into the bank. So that is a source of funds and a liability to the bank. Banks can also borrow. They can borrow from the central bank or they can borrow from other banks. So borrowings is a source of funds in order to make loans. And finally, bank capital is the residual value between the current value of their assets and what they owe to other people, which is the current value of their liabilities. It's a balance sheet, so we know the sum of the left-hand side must equal the sum of the right-hand side. Now, without going into too much detail with respect to the operation of the bank, the one key transaction I do want to talk about is the activity of making loans by banks. Because that activity, while it is done individually by the bank, simply as a source of profitability, is something that's critical in the operation of the monetary system. And the reason it's critical is for the following reason. What is your name? Sarah. Sarah? Good. If Sarah goes in to borrow money from a bank, she fills out a series of documents. And the bank does a big check on your background, Sarah, and what the purpose of the loan is. And they do an evaluation of you and what you may be buying, which may be collateral for the loan. And when the bank decides to make the loan, what is it they say when they call you up? When the bank agrees to make a loan to you, you all have seen this in advertisements. When a bank agrees to make a loan, what does they say on the phone? Congratulations. They say congratulations. What is that about? What do you mean congratulations? Congratulations, you have the opportunity to get some money from us today and pay us back a lot more money in the future. Congratulations, right? And the ads are great, right? They even have when the woman hears that she's been approved, what happens? A little tear runs down. <laughs> oh, honey, we've been approved. Listen to the term, by the way, approved. <laughs> That's a little parental, isn't it? Right? You've been approved to borrow money? Good. Banks love to have you in that position. Banks love to, to grant you credit. Listen to that term. I'm going to grant you a loan. No, no, no. You're going to agree to give me some money today, and I'm going to give you a lot more money in the future. Good. So here is the actual process, though. Sarah goes into the bank after she has been, quote, approved. And Sarah, let's, let's do the simple case where Sarah has a checking account in the bank. The loan in this case is for $10,000. Sarah signs a series of documents. And those documents are a promissory note to the bank or to whomever holds those notes that Sarah will, in fact, pay back the principal plus interest. It could be a time series of payments, like a mortgage. It could, could be a simple lump sum uh, time period loan between now and a year from now or whatever. Those documents the bank then places in their vault as an asset. Are you all with me? Sarah's promissory note is an asset to the bank. It's something of value to the bank because it's a promissory contract by Sarah to provide a stream of payments or a single payment in the future. Here is the loan transaction on the balance sheet. The bank receives Sarah's document and places that in their loan portfolio. So the value of their assets rises by $10,000. I'm only using the principal of the loan in this case. And then the bank adds $10,000 to Sarah's checking account. So the offsetting entry for the loan is the bank would increase Sarah's checking account balance by 10,000. The way it's done is the manager of the bank who has the authority takes the loan documents, puts them in the safe, puts his manager's code in and types in Sarah's account number and basically types in plus 10,000 and hits return. Sarah, if you walk outside to the ATM and look at your balance, it's $10,000 more than it was before. Everybody with me? Good. Where did the money come from? Where did the money come from? It's already there. 
Very good. No, no, look at, look at your transaction now. This is key. This is critical, which means it will be on the exam, hmm. right? This is critical to understand. The process of making a loan by a bank creates new money in the economy. Money was just created by this loan activity. Because if you'll notice on the balance sheet, the money supply is the sum of currency and circulation plus the current level of checkable deposits. When the bank made that loan, they just created $10,000 of new checkable deposits in the economy. We don't tend to think of it that way. You thought of it as, well, they must have moved it from another account. They, they must have taken some dollars from somewhere and moved it over into Sarah's account. No, no. Money was just created by the loan activity of that bank. It is brand new dollars that did not exist before. Question, what's Sarah going to do with it? Well, it goes back to my analysis before with Esther or whoever I was, uh, I was making a loan to. You're going to spend it. And notice it's now indistinguishable from all other money that's out there. Sarah writes a check to Thomas. Thomas deposits the check. You take some out in cash and buy things with it and so forth. It's out there circulating like all the other dollars in the economy. Everybody with me? Good. Now, when it comes time to repay that loan, Sarah will gather back into her checking account dollars from the economy through her business or being paid back or whatever, but she'll be saving up the dollars to repay that loan. And when you come in and make the payment, and in a simple example, we'll make it a lump sum payment, you write a check to the bank. You all with me? She writes a check to the bank to pay off the loan, just like you do on a mortgage loan, except you do it every month. The bank receives her check, and they hand her back the loan documents. So these are no longer assets. Oh, these are no longer working. They hand her back this $10,000 promissory note with a big smiley face stamped on it, meaning paid in full. And they reduce her checking account balance by the amount of her check. Is the transaction complete on the balance sheet? Yes because it's double entry bookkeeping, and what did I do? I reduced assets by 10, I reduced liabilities by 10. Where'd the money go? Where'd the money go? It's gone, right? It's gone. Think about it, it's gotta be gone, right? If the act of making a loan creates money, the act of repaying a loan must do what? Destroy money, exactly right. Now. You're saying to yourself, wait a minute, how can that be? Well, the point is that once Sarah has repaid her loan, that money is now destroyed, but the bank is now in a position to do what? Immediately make a new loan to someone else. The question that arises is, well, what controls the ability of the bank then to make these loans? Is there any control? Or can banks just create as much money as they want to? The answer is no. There is a control system in place. And it has to do with the fact that the Federal Reserve requires that for what you create in demand deposits, this number was 100, the Federal Reserve requires that for what you create in demand deposits through loans, you must hold a fraction of that in the categories of cash in the bank or deposits at the Fed. We have what is called a fractional reserve system. So the Fed requires banks to hold a portion of the money they've created through loans in the form of a safe asset. And the safest assets are vault cash or deposits up at the Fed. Those are readily on hand for the bank to use to pay out to you should you desire to take your money out of that particular bank. So how does the Federal Reserve control this operation? Well, they have three policy tools. One is the percentage of demand deposits that you're required to be holding as reserves. That's called the required reserve ratio. By lowering the required reserve ratio, it allows the banks to make more money through loans. By raising the reserve requirement, it restricts the bank's ability to create money through loans. The second method of creating reserves within the banking system is through loans from the Federal Reserve to the banks. And that is called the discount rate 
the interest charged by the Fed when they loan reserves out to the banks. So that's the second way the Fed can influence the bank's lending activity. I can make more loans to the bank, which creates new reserves that allows the bank to make multiple expansion through loans. But the primary method, again, important. The primary method the Fed uses to control the level of reserves in the system is what is called the open market operations of the Fed, which is in fact the buying and selling of government bonds by the central bank. Open market operations, the most significant and most effectively used policy tool of the Fed, is the buying and selling of government bonds by the Federal Reserve. Summary point. When the Fed buys a bond, it creates new reserves in the banking system. New reserves allows the bank to do what? Make more loans. Good. So the buying of bonds by the Fed is an expansionary monetary policy. Fed buys bonds, new reserves are created, allowing the banks to make more loans, which is creating more money. The opposite action of selling bonds by the Fed pulls reserves out of the system. And again, I'll refer you to the notes to see the examples of that. But the selling of bonds by the Fed pulls reserves out of the banking system that reduces the ability of banks to make loans, so it is contractionary monetary policy. Buying of bonds, expansionary. Selling of bonds, contractionary. Finally, as Dr. Whitman pointed out, these activities of the Fed also influence interest rates. So when the Fed buys bonds and creates new reserves in the banking system, it also tends to lower interest rates. Stop and think about it. It makes sense. There's more reserves available. Banks trying to make loans with them are competing against each other, and they are willing to lower the interest rate to make those loans. So expansionary monetary policy means expanding the money supply, and it means lowering interest rates. Contractionary monetary policy, primarily through the sale of bonds, that lowers reserves in the system, reducing money supply growth and raising interest rates. Okay. Uh, nothing particular to add there except to say that on this open market operations, uh, I noticed that that's one of the things that people get wrong most often by getting it exactly reversed. I think sometimes people think, okay, if you're selling something, that means you're getting more money. So that means must mean you're increasing the money supply. But that's exactly the reverse. Think about it this way. If I'm the Fed and you're the rest of the economy, right? You're a bunch of banks or individual investors, right? If I sell you bonds, do you have more or less money in your pockets afterwards? Less. Less, because you've just given me some money. So I just sucked some money out of the economy by selling you bonds. Right? So selling reduces the amount of cash that you guys have. Likewise, if I buy bonds, I'm taking the bonds back and I'm pushing money out into the economy. All right? So make sure you think about it from the perspective of the rest of the economy, what's happening, not from the perspective of the Fed, what's happening. All right? And that'll help you keep it straight in your head. That's it. Great. Good review session. Thanks for your attention. See you all in class on Monday. <laughs>